If you attend Richmond Hill High School, then you have definitely had many, many terrible interactions with traffic. Whether it's walking to school in the morning and almost getting run over by a car, or being in a car that's about to run someone else over. <laughs> traffic sucks, because people are not the best at driving, or urban planning, or road construction, or understanding traffic in general, or anticipating possible changes that come with new technology. And that's why people are starting to develop a new solution that removes humans from the equation. Self-driving cars. Self-driving cars are super cool. So let's look at the current state of self-driving cars. Several very large companies such as Uber, Google, Tesla, and General Motors have st already started to develop many advanced self-driving cars. As of right now, there are thousands of self-driving cars being tested on the road in major cities such as Pittsburgh and Phoenix. So self-driving cars have definitely come a long way since 2004, when there was this race of self-driving cars, and the goal was to get across this course of 240 kilometers. There were 15 cars in the race, and none of them finished the course. The car that got the furthest only went 11.4 kilometers before it got stuck on a rock and its front wheels caught on fire. <laughs> but thankfully, it's 2018, self-driving cars are now about as good as the average human. In fact, they're even better than the average human in some respects. For example, their reflexes are thousands of times faster than human reflexes, and their snap judgment also tends to be more accurate. However, self-driving cars are not quite perfect yet, because they are, for example, easily distracted and easily confused by things such as snow. Its sensors aren't really good at detecting snow yet, and since we live in Canada, that makes them limited in their abilities for about half of the year. Self-driving cars are also easily confused by things like plastic bags, roadkill, fallen trees, and hurricanes. You know, things you don't really see every day. But despite these small technological problems that self-driving cars have, I think that the really big problems will be about societal integration. Because people don't want their robot cars to be about as good as the average human. Because the average human is pretty terrible at driving. People want their self-driving cars to be nearly perfect. So what would the world look like when self-driving cars have replaced traditional cars? First, driving safety. People are really, really terrible drivers. They don't stop at stop signs. They don't use their turn signals. They text while driving. I have even seen people do their makeup while driving, which can't be good for their safety or for their makeup. 1.3 million people die each year because of car accidents. That's an average of 3,287 people every day. And if self-driving cars can reduce that number by even a fraction, that's a lot of lives saved. And self-driving cars will be far better drivers than humans because they will never get bored, distracted, or drunk. Self-driving cars are far more reliable, and because they run on a program, these programs can have backup plans in place. Second, congestion and traffic efficiency. So, you know when you're at an intersection and like you have to stop for the red light, even there are no other cars going the other way and you're just sort of stuck there? Or like those cars who insist on changing lanes every 30 seconds because they think the other lane is going faster, but really they're just slowing everybody down. This kind of thing will never happen with self-driving cars because self-driving cars won't be acting individually as a single unit. They'll be constantly communicating with the thousands of other vehicles around it, acting in a seamless, continuous loop of cars. This makes behaviors such as platooning possible. So platooning is basically when a group of cars travel very, very closely together at very high speeds. They stop and start at exactly the same time. This has the potential to increase traffic capacity by up to 500% because cars can travel so much more closely together when they're communicating together. This means that people could get to where they're going much, much faster because more cars can just fit on the road. And third, the mental burden of driving. So most people think driving is just, oh, something you do every day, something that, something that people just do because they have to, but really it's a series of very complex interactions with your environment. You're constantly processing information and you're constantly making thousands of small decisions in a very short amount of time. 
And this means that people who have long commutes to work, they often have an increased, increased levels of frustration and increased levels of stress. But with self-driving cars, people can exercise in their cars, they can do yoga in their cars, they can sleep in their cars. This looks like a very, very comfortable car to sleep in. And when people don't have to have this mental burden of having to drive everywhere, they, they can use their mental energy for so many better things. This ties into my next point, four, about free time while driving. So we think that when people have, the average person drives two hours every single day. That's a lot of time that can be used for a lot of different things. Like, say you're a business person, you have a, and you wake up in the morning, and you have a really important financial report due, and your boss is like, hand it in to me first thing this morning. And you're like, well, I didn't work on it yesterday, but it's okay, you have the 45 minutes on the way to work in your self-driving car to finish up your report. And if traffic is really bad, you have 55 minutes. Oh wait, no, traffic won't be bad, because self-driving cars are amazing. <laughs> Free time also provides us with more social opportunities. For example, dating apps on self-driving cars. So this might not make a lot of sense at first, but please let me explain. So when you have self-driving cars, the car can drive itself, so it doesn't need to be parked nearby. It can just drop you off at school and then go and drive someone else. This means that people are less likely to own their own cars, because that's more expensive and inconvenient than just hailing an Uber that's, that happens to be self-driving. And Uber has this option where you can choose to carpool with people. So it can put you in the same car as a bunch of other people who are going in the same direction as you. And this means that dating apps on self-driving cars can put you in the same carpool as other people who have the same interests as you and are going in the same direction as you. <laughs> this means, and it's, it's not just dating apps, people can also have book clubs and chess clubs in the car. The point is, it's a lot better than having to drive. This brings me to my next point, five. Uh, wait. Five, urban planning. So we live in the suburbs. I kind of hate it because A, I hate walking, right? And like, even though we have buses, I don't want to walk to the bus stop. And B, I am navigationally challenged. I cannot read maps. And when you're in the suburbs, it's all loop-de-loops and cul-de-sacs and I never know where I'm going. But with self-driving cars, I won't have to use public transit because I'll just be in the self-driving car. Or self-driving cars could even increase use of public transit by being a first mile, last mile measure. Like for example, if you need to get to a train station, the self-driving car can take you to the nearest train station. You can go on a train ride across the country or something, and then a self-driving car can take you to your final destination because reducing the need to walk makes it far more likely that people will even consider taking the train in the first place. Additionally, self-driving cars can solve the problem of traffic because with the ride share option, if say everybody doesn't own a car and instead they choose to have self-driving Ubers, cars will be active for far more of the day because as of right now, cars are only used for about 5% of the day. But with self-driving cars, that could bring this number up to 15 or even 20%. And when more people are, um, when more people are on self-driving cars, there are less self-driving cars being parked. This means we could get rid of our parking lot and build more green, more buildings, or have more green space and more parks. I think that self-driving cars really offer us a new opportunity to look at our community and our societies and redesign them into ways that suit human needs into ways that are more sustainable, livable, and comfortable, not just built around the idea of the car. So, three things to take away from my TED Talk. First, self-driving cars have the potential to fix a lot of things that are wrong with traffic today. Second, I am not a fortune teller. While I've tried to predict many of the changes that self-driving cars will bring, we really don't know what's going to happen yet. So we have to be careful with the rules and regulations we put in place to make sure that we get as many benefits as we can from self-driving cars. And three, if you can drive, please drive safely.